Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Bank Hall, for having me here today. Ladies and gentlemen, have you had a good morning? Yes. Fantastic. Are you ready for a great afternoon? Yes. Excellent. Welcome to risk taking and decision making in poker, business, and life with myself, Casper Berry. I hope, in some way, most of you agree with that. Uh, all of what we're talking about here today is that subject of risk and risk taking. George certainly threw a bit of a curveball around that subject, didn't he, when he talked about his own background in motorsport. Uh, I think risk can be a great thing to embrace in our lives. The trouble is, whether it's as George did it or as anyone does it, it can be dangerous. Things can happen when we embrace this thing. Not always the thing that we thought would happen when we woke up that morning. I'm sure some of you remember this photo. It went round on email about seven years ago and there was some debate about whether it was real or not. In the end, the photographer won an award. So I think it is a real photo, ladies and gentlemen, but I don't, I don't think that is. Uh, but that is someone taking risk. They're taking risk in their life. I don't think that is a real photo. But these people are taking risk <laughs> in their lives, whether we like it or not. Um, risk is definitely something. That is a real photo, terrifyingly. So is that. Doesn't look a lot uh, there. Looks a lot more risky in that context, doesn't it? Risk is definitely something we can choose to embrace in our lives. But it's also, it's quite a slippery word, that word risk, because risk is also something that can happen to us, whether we like it or not. Sometimes it's just going to happen to one poor, unfortunate person or individual. It doesn't make it any less painful if that person happens to be you. Sometimes it's going to happen in quite personal, intimate moments, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Sometimes very intimate. <laughs> we don't want, we don't want, we don't want this sort of thing to happen. Sometimes much more public and embarrassing. Uh, it's going to strike us. This gentleman found out the subject of a photo story in the Daily Mail. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the Daily Mail, we do not want any of those things to happen to us as a result of today. And therefore, uh, as John said in his introduction, I'm going to try and contain this subject of risk to a much safer world, safer probably even than the financial world, to the world of poker. Uh, that's the world I'm going to use as my metaphor. So I'm not going to ask anyone uh, for any sort of participation. Do not worry. But quick show of hands, who here plays poker or has played poker in the past? Okay, about a third of you, I would say. Who here, therefore, by contrast, has never, ever played poker in their lives? Excellent. I think we've got the first bluff of the day from a few of you there, haven't we? I'm looking at you, sir. You'd be the one I'd be worried about. Um, as John said, I was a professional player for three years of my life, living and working at the tables in Las Vegas. It was a, a wonderful experience. It's really the things that I learnt, I would say, about life and about risk-taking during that period that I want to share with you today. Actually, that wasn't the highlight of my poker playing life. That came uh, in three weeks in the spring of 2006 out in Prague when I was the poker advisor on the old James Bond movie, Casino Royale. Has anyone here seen the film? Yeah. yeah. It's crap, isn't it? But <laughs> it was a great experience. Uh, and obviously, I was very privileged to be asked to do it because there's a lot of competition for that. As I'm sure some of you know, poker is massively changing. Even before the poker boom, 50 million Americans claim to play poker on at least a monthly basis. And that has hugely changed in the last six years with the advent of internet poker that has massively changed the shape of the game. More and more women have gone into the game, which broadly speaking, broadly speaking, I think is a good thing. More and more young people also playing the game now. I do have mixed feelings about this, folks. It's slippery slope that I worry about. How long before we See something of that nature. He's having a good time. That doesn't make it right. <laughs> what I really want to do today, actually, is just use poker as a springboard, as I said, to jump into the broader context of, of business and life. So I'm not going to talk too much about the game, and it might uh, confuse people who've never played here. But I do want to bust one myth, I think, one myth about poker. Because in the summer of 99, everybody asked me when I decided to be a, a professional player, one question, one question only, and that was, let's see your poker face. That was the question that I got asked. And actually, your poker face is a much smaller part of the game than people might imagine. Look, you can see this guy's doing everything he can to cover up his face. The fact that you can play online at all shows that it must be much less about interaction than about something else. This guy, Lane Flack, made a whole brand out of the hooded top and the shades. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be playing poker outside these doors after dinner tonight. I do expect as many of you as possible to come and join us. We'll give you all a beginner to win a lesson, so no experience necessary. And if you've got the equipment, do come dressed like that. That's going too far, all right? We don't want to see any of that. Let's keep it clean, folks. But what are you trying to do tonight and whenever you play poker? Essentially, you're just making a series of decisions. A decision that you need to make every 90 seconds. A decision that you can't advocate, that you can't procrastinate, that you cannot delegate. A decision that you must make. And it was that process of forced decision making, if you like, for three years of my life that I found absolutely fascinating. 
What was it that was bringing me to the conclusions that I came to? Why were those conclusions sometimes different to the players around me when faced with exactly the same situation? To put it a little bit more philosophically, why was I doing what I was doing? That's really the question I want to ask today. How do we make decisions? Let's just think a little bit about the decisions that we make. Uh, the very first decision that we all make every single day is, of course, uh, whether or not to press that snooze button. That's the, the very first one. Uh, what to wear, uh, how, how, what to eat, uh, how we get to work that day. Once we're at work, in fact, the subject of some of this morning's conversations, how we allocate our time. These are massive decisions that we're making. Some people here must have to uh, take meetings, and uh, both internally and externally. Some people may have to hire people or fire people. Even if you don't have to do that, it might be a question of navigating your own route through your career and your life. And those start to bleed into quite big personal life decisions. Who to spend our very brief time on this planet with? That's quite a spectrum there, from the smallest to the largest. So let me just say a couple of things about decisions and decision making before we go further. The first thing is, in the eight years since I stopped being a professional poker player, it's been my privilege to work with hundreds of companies all over the world on that subject of decisions and decision making. And I say to all of them what I say to you now which is that it's not for me to say what decisions you should be making and taking. You are all experts in this field, a field about which I know far less than you, and of course you are all experts in your own lives. Only you can be the judge of the decisions that you make. But it is my job during this 30 minutes to, to provoke you, to catalyze some thought, hopefully some thoughts which I, uh, I expect will continue, I would love them to, after this session, maybe even after today. And that provocative question that I'm therefore going to use to stimulate those thoughts is this, ladies and gentlemen. Are the decisions that you are making the best decisions to get you to wherever it is that you want to get to? i say that again. Are the decisions that you're making individually, collectively, with your teams, with your colleagues, with your family, with your friends, the best decisions to get you all to your chosen outcome or stated goal? Or, conversely, is something stopping you from making and taking those optimal decisions, those decisions which maximize productivity and efficiency and shorten the amount of time that it's going to take to get you to that destination? Are they external? Are they internal obstacles? I also want to put a phrase out there which may, for some people, change the way you think about all the decisions that you make. It's a phrase which I think everyone has been touching on throughout the course of this morning, and I know we touched on it in the conversations this afternoon, and it's this. All decisions are investment decisions. All decisions are investment decisions. We tend to think about that word, certainly uh, among, the, among this community, as being the allocation of that great scarce resource that is money, usually for a period of time. That's what investment is. But money is just one of many scarce resources that we're allocating at any given moment. Of course, the great scarce resource that we all have is time itself. Sometimes we measure that very rationally in hours, minutes, and seconds, sometimes more emotionally in terms of our attention, our passion, our energy, our dedication to a person or a project or a scheme or an idea, our degree of comfort, our health is a scarce resource, our liberty, even our life is on the line there. I hope that doesn't describe most of the decisions that you make, but certainly as George is hurtling down that mountain, it's there to be lost. <laughs> 